Let's talk about airway now. Um, but a few little pro tips I would give you. Number one is, um, our first uh, response when we see a sick patient is to lie them on their back so we can assess them or do CPR, do um, treatments on them. But immediately we're compromising their airway. For um, an unconscious patient who's put on their back, their soft tissues become lax. Their head position typically points a little bit down. They end up flexing naturally because of the occiput of the head. And it closes down the airway, which is a, a soft tissue too. And so what immediately we need to worry about is, is this person snoring, meaning do they have partial airway obstruction? Um, are they breathing, breathing and ventilating adequately? Is oxygen getting in and is CO2 getting out in a normal fashion? And what we need to do is take that soft tissue and essentially with a head tilt, chin lift, we extend it. We're pulling uh, the, the airway tube at the back of the throat open, right? With a head tilt and a chin lift and maintaining it. Sometimes it'll only take a little bit of pressure at the chin to maintain an open airway. And by doing this, you're pulling the soft tissues off the, uh, the airway, off the, the, the breathing tube in the back there, uh, pulling the jaw and the tongue forward a bit. Um, what else can we do? We may be worried about material in the person's airway. If this patient's had a drowning, um, or if maybe they have anaphylaxis, we need to look in the tongue and make sure that the airway is not impacted with sand, that there's not foreign material in there. Now I want to caution you, here's a, a, a real pro tip I want to give you. Every patient that's drowned will produce, uh, with CPR, will produce copious amounts of foam. It'll come out of their nose almost like a bubble machine, it'll be excessive. And where we fall down is by using our suction to suction out the mouth and the, the nose of this foam that really never ends. The more CPR, more compressions you're doing, the more foam you generate. And if you pause to suction foam, you will compromise um, their ventilation and oxygenation. So do never, never suction foam. Ignore it. If, if you've got thin uh, secretions, water, or thin vomitus in the airway, keep going, keep bagging them. Don't waste time on suction because what you're doing is you're compromising their ventilation and their oxygenation during that time. So right now we've got good head position. Maybe we need to, in a young child, an infant, put um, a towel under the shoulders to get the body, the torso, elevated up so that the airway is in good alignment. Maybe in, in an adult, let's just for a second here, we're just going to put a two centimeter pad, like a towel, t-shirt, anything, under the head to get that sniffing position where that the head is extended forward and the airway is as aligned and open as it can be. What do we what mistake do we make commonly is we we set things up well and then we go about our other business and maybe we're doing compressions, maybe we're doing ventilations, we forget about the airway and over time you'll naturally see patients drip down. When you're in this chin down position your airway is occluded, especially when you're on your back. So a few things I would tell you, assign a person to maintain airway. If you don't maintain airway from the beginning and throughout the recess successfully, the rest of your recess can't work. No matter what else is going on, defibrillation, big time resuscitation uh, interventions, if you fail on the first step, which is airway management, and you don't keep that airway open, the rest is all for naught. Um, just a couple other things I want to add. One is, don't be in a rush to force a patient onto their back. Again, that compromises their ability to maintain their own airway. Um, now, if the patient is able to tolerate a different position, they should be allowed to remain in their position of comfort. Now, I'm going to talk about a patient that's completely unconscious, uh, in whom you have to do a lot of airway interventions. But if someone is, is with it enough to breathe on their own in a position of comfort, don't force them to come out of that position. Let them assume that position, work around them, do your best to keep them in a position of comfort. Yeah. Recovery position. If you've got a patient who's breathing spontaneously, don't force them to be supine. Put them in recovery position, 
head down, so if there is vomitus or, or, or regurgitation, it'll go into the sand, and keep them in that position, because they will protect their own airway better than you can protect their airway when they're on their back. The risk of putting a patient on their back is that if, if there is a little bit of passive regurgitation or active vomiting, what's in the stomach will drift up the airway and then soil the lungs, it will enter the lungs. And now you take in a patient who is just unconscious or obtunded or in a coma or brain injured, and now you've given them an aspiration pneumonia on top of that. Vomit in the lungs is, is bad, and it, it takes a bad situation and makes it a critical situation. So to the extent that it's possible, if the patient spontaneously breathing doesn't need chest compressions, doesn't need other interventions, put them in recovery position. Uh, a spontaneously breathing patient should be in recovery position at almost all, all times. And one more thing that I think is worth mentioning is if there's solid material in the airway or really thick liquids like chunky vomit that are really occluding or partially occluding the airway. Um, that's the sort of thing that you can't just work around, you've got to get it out. And that's going to be by turning the patient on their side and manually removing what you can see. We don't do blind finger sweeps, but if we can see material, we get it out. So we turn the patient on their side so gravity is helping us. Obviously, we have our gloves on. And we get the material out and quickly get them back in a position where we can do CPR.